Welcome once again to Arctic Fire. This unique gathering of swordsmiths explores the outer edge of the craft, where craftsmanship, artistry, storytelling, history, and myth combine. This year, the group has recreated objects found in the legendary horde of Grendel, from the most ancient surviving poem in Old English, Beowulf. Four days of live broadcast in which legends will be reborn. Arctic Fire 2016, Grendel's Horde. I would like to start with something you won't see in the video, uh, but it needs to be said, and it's safety. Uh, you probably want to use uh, eye protection, especially if you, don't want, uh, if you don't wear glasses in your normal life. I have never uh, experienced any uh, flying splinters or something, but uh, if I m have, I may have not been here because I would be blind, so uh, that's not a proof of anything. Uh, you may want to use uh, uh, hearing protection, but uh, if you are using either of these two, uh, these two tools, it's not like uh, severe uh, noise, but uh, it gets annoying. Uh, but what you definitely want to use, and I won't be using that because I need to talk, uh, is a um, respirator of, so, of some sort. Uh, force air respirator uh, is the best option, but it uh, interferes sometimes with your need to use a magnifier. So just the respirator might be a, might be an optimal choice. Uh, the thing is that if you if you grind uh, antler with like coarse rotary file tool, uh, the dust will be pretty grit gritty, so it will fall quite uh, quite uh, fast on the ground. But if you are using something like a diamond uh, covered tool or some some uh, artificial stone tool, the dust is very fine, doesn't really settle, so you would be breeding that and um, there is actually a very special disease for uh, bladesmith. It's, I think, called uh, silicosis, and uh, it was very, uh, very often a disease of uh, knivesmith working with bone and ivory for handles, and you don't want to get that. So use lung protection. That said, uh, there is a, I had a, a last minute idea uh, how to make my uh, life mo more interesting. So I will, I will walk you through the process of making uh, the carving, but, and I will uh, in the end carve the, the pin from antler. And I decided I, I, I would like you uh, to have a say in what I will carve. I will provide you with three options. I may carve a boar. A dragon, dragon. or eagle. So uh, comment uh, on our Facebook page, and I will, I will, I will carve what what you have decided uh, I should. But for sorry, yeah, uh, the uh, there are. Uh, three things I would like to touch first before I start working. One is the tool. Uh, first one is the tool. Uh, I use Dremel. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's less powerful than Fordham type tool, but it's, um, its ergonomics are much finer. Uh, and uh, I think that the handpiece is uh, because it's like rubbery and and uh, plastic. It uh, it holds better. This one is cool that uh, it has a pedal, but you can buy one for Dremel too. Uh, I noticed something very funny uh, last Arctic Fire because I'm not used to using a pedal switch operator in my carving. So <laughs> when I was I was uh, stomping on the on the switch, even if I was carving by hand with just a chisel and graver, not, <laughs> not using. So it was really, re really <laughs> weird experience. Uh, so um, you can, uh, this one is uh, really cool. And if you can have both, uh, this one for more coarse work and this one for finer, it's really good. 
uh, as far as uh, uh, concern about those bits that uh, go in, I have uh, a use range of those, but uh, most of my work is done with one type of the tool uh, with, uh, in different sizes and it's, uh, it's called inverted cone and if in Magnificent the tool looks like this. This is the shaft of the tool and this is tooth uh, head of the tool which also has teeth from from above. It's very very important for me because this section here provides V-shaped grooving. Like if you would uh, be engraving with the you what's what's the onglet? Is it onglet? Uh, uh, graver. Uh, yeah, I think so, yes. yeah uh, as you would be carving with onglet graver. Uh, and you can use uh, the top of the tool for flattening surfaces. Uh, so this one is really good for um, mimicking the hand tooling. Uh, there are also uh, tools with uh, this kind of working part, which is uh, quite simply a rotary file or the little spheric ones that are uh, that are good for like setting um, garnet eyes and stuff like that and they are actually very good for like very coarse removing of backgrounds and uh, stuff like that but uh, if uh, if I have uh, to use only one of those I would definitely use this one you can do almost everything with it uh, it comes uh, in different sizes and you can uh, you will probably be using um, 3.2 millimeter shaft for the coarse carving, for removing material shaping if you are doing real sculpting carving. And there is another one which is this dimension and uh, I use that for most of the engraving and fine carving. Uh, the, the head of the tool is not really in any relationship to the shaft of the tool, but uh, uh, like those bigger uh, heads comes only with the 3.2 millimeter shaft. So that's, uh, that's what I uh, have to say about the tool. And now I shall speak some, uh, a little bit about the material. Uh, you can use this type of carving for certain kinds of wood, but no, it's not really uh, designed for being used on wood. And if I say uh, certain kinds of wood, I mean boxwood, full stop. <laughs> 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 um, it's a, I actually call boxwood antler for vegetarians. <laughs> it's a, it's a plant-based antler. Uh, so you can, you can, you can do that. Uh, you can use it on, um, on horn, but uh, horn has some stringy, layery uh, character that uh, is quite contradictive for Dremel use, but uh, you can use it at least for the uh, coarse carving and then move to a more um, hand tool approach. And you can use it for bone, which, is, uh, which works uh, awesome and uh, fine, and, uh, but I don't like really uh, uh, working with bone. Um, the reason for it is that I think the antler is designed to work as, as like the solitary piece because it's, uh, it's on the outside of the animal. But the bone is designed to work uh, covered with muscle and stuff, so it's much, much more brittle. And also the dust um, produced while uh, engraving uh, bone is much finer. It has sliminess to it, so I think uh, breathing breathing that is uh, uh, it's uh, it's much worse than antler. Regarding the sp uh, species of the of the animal to, to use antler from, uh, you can use various kinds of deer, reindeer, uh, or elk. I think uh, my most favorite is reindeer, or which would be caribou. 
uh, here uh, because it has a it's a great compromise of uh, being hard enough but having uh, enough uh, of the solid part uh, the best for the for three-dimensional deep carving is mousse uh, but I have uh, experienced that uh, smaller animals that live in Europe are actually better than uh, those bigger bigger monsters in here because if if the if the antler would be really solid in these sizes it would be super heavy so they are uh, more porous than European kind and uh, red deer is awesome if you if you really want to place your piece into certain uh, area for example if you want to do a English piece uh, you want to use a red deer because there are no reindeer in England and there are no uh, moose or elk in, in England so you want to use red deer uh, on the other hand if you want to do a Norwegian piece you you uh, you are going for reindeer because it's uh, it's very common animal there um, you can uh, uh, soften the uh, antler uh, by various techniques uh, some of them are heat related some of them are uh, moisture related uh, some of them use uh, light acid like vinegar or sour milk uh, to somehow dissolve them but it's not really the case uh, while using the rotary device because if you if you soften it before carving with rotary device you will get like some buttery antlery ugliness so uh, I am using uh, water during carving but I'm wiping it and uh, leaving it a little bit dry before approaching the next step of rotary car carving so it's not ex actually really like uh, doesn't really go well together wetting the antler and carving it with Dremel um, there are uh, I want to touch about uh, on uh, various types of carving uh, it's uh, it's mainly for people who are thinking about starting to do that because if you are uh, if you are in carving already you will notice that but there are there are several approaches how to how to uh, execute your design on uh, on antler piece uh, first I'm always looking for this and it's tied in here uh, first uh, of those is what I call uh, engraver like carving because you are actually producing carving that's just engraving in the uh, in the surface that could be represented as this honeycomb design on the uh, on the comb I made it's just if you if you took uh, graver and removed lines of uh, material and it would look like engraving then you uh, that uh, another thing you can do is uh, base relief carving that you are uh, executing your design as uh, protruding from the surface and removing the background so it looks like it's emerging from the surface uh, there's a option how to how to make it simpler for you and it uh, it's uh, somehow something in between those two that you are uh, rounding uh, the edges of, of the carving and you are creating illusion of being three-dimensional uh, while it's uh, two and a half dimensional or something like that uh, and uh, there is another one which is uh, extremely uh, interesting and possibly the hardest to do and it's uh, actual chip carved mm -hmm. thing that the just these tips of those ridges are creating the lines this one is very hard to do uh, for one reason and it's uh, because you are not only carefully creating all the designs you have to have on your piece but you are really concerned of the quality and the acuteness of meeting of the slopes of those ridges because this creates this uh, awesome effect of uh, reflecting light it's, uh, uh, it's the technique that was used in, uh, in bronze and uh, gilded bronze or gold 
because the re reflection is everything with this. But it's a very cool thing if you can execute it in Carvin. You will probably uh, see something like this uh, on the on the pin, and it's uh, uh, it's the technique that uh, that connects with this one, uh, because uh, actually having very nice polished, very smooth background is pretty hard thing to do. Uh, but if you are able to texture the background and you break it to smaller pieces, it looks much, much more intricate than just flat and it's uh, actually easier to do. So uh, it's a good, uh, good advice to think about texturing the background of, of your carving. Um, I, will uh, I will talk about uh, the carving while I am doing that, but uh, there are two uh, rules, I, I have to invent it for myself because I'm self-taught uh, and I think that they are like crucial for, for you being able to carve successfully with the rotary tool. First one is, again, that uh, if you are car if you have a uh, rotary, rotary tool that rotates like this, you are trying. You are always moving it towards yourself, against the uh, the direction of rotation. Because if you do it that way, it will run with you, and you have to be uh, you have to be leading the tool. You cannot uh, uh, let the tool lead you. And the other one, it's uh, it's uh, mm, probably pretty hard to explain. I think that I have a. Uh, really good explanation for it, but people have a problem to understand it. And it's uh, if you are using this type of tool and you are car carving arch uh, like this, you have to always place your tool this way. It's because uh, if you do it the opposite way, you will you will uh, do it very wide and clumsy. So if you are approaching from, from outside, you are able to squeeze these uh, lozenge shapes because it's like continually static process. It's not like that you are doing some magic of being really uh, moving the tool around. You are at this place, at this place, at this place in the time. So you are able to place them neatly uh, beside each other and you are able to execute uh, smooth design. So these two things are crucial for you uh, to be able to carve successfully. Um, I will touch on the, the speed. Uh, I am always trying to carve at the biggest speed available for the tool. I find no uh, advantage of slowing in that case. I, I think it's probably because I'm using toothed tools, not like smooth or just abrasives. So I think in my uneducated, physically uneducated mind, that uh, being able to uh, transfer the straight portions of the tools in, in the time uh, F more quickly, you are doing more smooth uh, tool marks. So, but but it's uh, it's just uh, my explanation. Uh, another thing to touch upon is uh, the paradox of using a modern tool based on different principle, but wanting to have a effect of uh, being completely handmade in a period tools. Uh, there is a possibility that you are able to uh, teach yourself to carve so smoothly that uh, your uh, using uh, of modern tool is not really recognizable. But uh, it's advisory that you always go over every surface with hand tool and make it like the last uh, hundredth of millimeter of material should be removed by hand, either scraped or uh, carved or s or um, engraved, so so uh, your tool marks are actually identical to the tool marks of people who would use just the hand tools. 
I will probably, I, I'm probably ready to move to the carving and, but yeah, do we have any questions? Yeah, One for the eagle, and because of, you can't tell this audience to stay within uh, bound lines, two for wolf and one for bear. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it looks at this point like the boar okay. has carried the boat. One for hedgehog. One for hedgehog. <laughs> so uh, can yeah, I, you'll, should you'll, I talk some more uh, that, so eagle wins? Uh, <laughs> you're going to have to talk for a while. There's only one for eagle. <laughs> looks okay. like, it looks like the boar's got it. Okay. Uh, but... Um, as I would be uh, probably a bit more invested in, uh, in the carving with all the rotary and uh, noisy part than Jake was. Is there something you would like to know before I start um, from, from uh, my, my uh, local audience or I'm good to, good to start? Okay, you know everything. Oh, so I have, I have a question for you. Um, do you use the the discs at all for cutting lines? Like uh, I have discs that I I have like I got one of these and I I've got the the little discs and I can't. And what's the, what's uh, is, is it like a saw? Like little or stone like discs. A, stone discs. Yeah. No, 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 I don't use that. Okay. Um, I would lay out some design for the eagle, so I can. It's not a democracy. <laughs> it's not an ego. It <laughs> okay. Well, I just tried it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> How that happened? <laughs> Better the dictator. <laughs> no, I'm not carving an eagle. Who do you think I? <laughs> what you should do is just carve an eagle and say that it's a boar. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I'm trying to design something uh, inspired by um, <coughs> old Germanic art. I will be using a Salen style too because it's the first style where you can actually quite easily recognize the species that uh, that's there. It would be a, a pin from the period when Beowulf was uh, already old and preparing to die in a confrontation with the dragon. Uh, and, uh, this, this audience is not going to just take, you know, straight choices. I, now they're telling you, you're coming back to the board board, so I just said, Someone uh, wants um, wings on the board, please. Uh -huh. James, James Elmsy. Everyone knows boars have wings, talons, and a beak. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jerome says, watch out for the big mech warrior. <laughs> and Glenn Clayton th uh, says, wouldn't that be a beagle? <laughs> of, course. <laughs> of course, it's a beagle. Oh, that's a good one, Glenn. <laughs> so I have made the... Uh, Designed for the beagle. <laughs> the beagle. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see how it's a trick from, I think, Sutton Who, but I'm not sure. It may be the Aker Akir uh, buckle. Uh, the lower lip of the boar is turned to be his tusk. Oh. It goes mm. through, the, through the mouth and turns to the tusk. Uh, this uh, ridge or eyebrow that's uh, usually on those designs will be. Uh, also acting as an ear of the of the boar and mm. I will I will uh, cut the uh, overall shape with this type of tool which I wouldn't do at home I would normally use a jeweler saw but I want you to see how how quickly the material removes and uh, then I will cut the lines try to do some ornamentation and uh, Hopefully, we can answer some questions during that. So. I thought he was going to say, and now I will start to castrate. <laughs> you know what? I'll start to castrate. <laughs> so, you can see that even in, in this case, I am applying the tool from the side and from the top equally.
background that uh, uh, that uh, won't be there uh, I always encourage people uh, I'm teaching how to carve uh, to think about the material that has to be removed not to be concerned about the material that has to stay because that way you uh, you will be able to work quickly if you are concentrating on on the snow you have to shovel from your driveway and not on your driveway you will be able to do it much more quickly. May I ask you, Yul, if you would be able to take the bowl uh, you will be using with the bowl uh, and uh, give me some water for uh, for the carbon course, because yeah. I forget about it. You can see there is a one thing. I, I don't know if uh, if we can get uh, close up enough. There is a little triangle. Uh, I wasn't able to to carve out because of the geometry of my tool. There will be a it will be much more acute uh, angle and I will have to do it with the lozenge or inver inverted cone because that will fit right in. So now I will, uh, now I, am, I have an outline ready and I will move to carving actual lines inside. So uh, I will just uh, make my lines more Thank you very much. Uh, more visible, so I don't. Uh, if I accidentally smear them, uh, I will still be able to say where they are. Uh, you can uh, you can use a CD uh, CD marker and antler, but uh, there there is there is a possibility that if your antler has some porousness to it, it will it will be sucked in the pores. So uh, you will be able to find, uh, like by touching it by or by experience, if you can, if you uh, can use it. Uh, it's uh, of course uh, more possible to use it if uh, if you have some like deeper carving and you know you are removing much more material, so uh, it won't uh, it won't stay there. Another thing is uh, uh, to which. Great. To what grid uh, do you want to bring your piece before carving? I think it's some somewhere around 200. Not very. Not polish it very much because if you polish it, uh, your pencil will smear so easily that uh, it's uh, it's annoying. Uh, but uh, it also depends on the type of uh, the carving because if you are doing this uh, chip carving, you can have it coarse like 80 because none of the uh, surface would uh, really remain on the piece and if you are doing this you want to have it close to the final polish because uh, you don't want to polish it afterwards because as you can see the the width of the groove is the function of its depth so if you are polishing something out you are losing the width of the of the line so you want uh, because you want to carve you want to carve it as uh, as you see it. Uh, it's better to do uh, to do it in a, like a final or close to the final polish. So uh, I will uh, replace my tool and because I'm going down with the um, with the shaft dimension, I have to re replace the collet. I think it's called. And there is a there is an uh, adjustable chuck for Dremel. It's uh, um, very similar to this one. Uh, you can buy it, you can, uh, you can screw it right on. And uh, I don't really have super great experience with it because uh, if you are using this 
type of tool in it. You are using it quite heavily sideways and it really damages the springs that are holding the jaws of the, of the chuck. So it doesn't really uh, hold uh, the tool very strong and you are, uh, you are forced to use the, the wrench, the wrench. What's the name of it? Yeah, yeah. yeah and uh, it kind of uh, uh, like it's contradictory to the fact that you you are just want to do it fast. So uh, now I'm looking for the tool. Nick wants to know: Can you overcarve the line to allow for the final surface polish? Uh, I, I did not understand. Can you can you ask, uh, can you read it once again? Sure, you're just describing how the width of the line is a function of the depth. And so if you have a very shallow line, you don't want, you want to polish the surface. Yeah, so you yeah, want to yeah know, of could course. You, could you overcarve, uh, make it deeper? So you yeah, yeah, yeah. Allow sure, sure. There is, no, uh, there is no reason why not. Uh, it really depends on uh, how confident you are about skidding and um, like marring your polish. So... Uh, you can do it. Uh, I think that it's uh, it's quite possible, but uh, it uh, still applies that you want to you you want to have some coarseness for pencil to stay and some um, and I, I'm using steel wool for like um, smoothing out the the lines, so um, it ki kinds of polish it very well without having to go to 800 grit. Carve your do your carving deeper than you want the carving, and in order to allow for the removal of surface when you polish yeah, it you afterwards, can do it. right? You can do it, but you have to adjust your uh, mind to to, right. to calculate how much width you will lose. Yeah, that's uh, personal preference, I suppose. So I, I'm now using a 2.35 uh, millimeter shad with I don't know one uh, point five millimeter tool, yes. Where do you buy your bars? I buy them in the jeweler supply, but oh. uh, Dictum uh, supplies them. Okay. So, And it's, uh, they are called inverted cone. Mm -hmm. Any special material, fabrication uh, you uh, it's a It's a rotary tool, uh, like it, uh, I think I, I'm, I'm using this May I? No. You, you have to go to the website and find it. I, I suppose from uh, covering the company name that I'm not going to oh, that's true. say the <laughs> name of the company. So I will start to engrave. So I'm moving towards myself. Rotation is like this. I'm really moving towards. So, so I, hope, I hope you will be able to 
watch it. You want, you want more questions? Yep. Um, does Petro have any experience with air powered die grinders? <clears throat> That's not a complaint about the noise, by the way. Uh, no, no. Okay. Oh. That was, there you go. In the, in the piece and uh, I will now uh, I will carve this one more I forget to carve I will show you how to remove the background here in this section and then I will uh, do some uh, hand scraping and then possibly if time allows some uh, fine carving in the inside of those lines do we have some? I have about 10 minutes okay So now carving this line and then I'm using the, the edge of the tool in the breaking motion and I'm just removing the material very quickly. I'm trying for the uniform depth of uh, the tool mark. But I'm not really concerned uh, with the surface right now. Just removing the material. And now the time comes for the top of the tool, and I'm positioning it towards the surface. And at the time, I would rather wear my fire. Because uh, I, I will be meeting the lines I carve uh, with the sharp edge, so. I want to I want to really see what I'm doing. see some uh, shapes and you can see that it's still, still more like um, polygons and not really curves but it will I, I will uh, revisit the places and uh, make it smooth afterwards now I will like to soften the surface a little bit and I will be using this scraper tool I made from broken needle file 
You can make smaller ones from uh, broken uh, Dremel bits. I'm also using uh, onglet uh, carving uh, engraving tool uh, to smooth the lines and to make nice uh, nice triangle cross section uh, working marks. There is a one thing that uh, it's worth mentioning is the positioning the tool to the surface, as uh, this indicates that the tool is somehow close to. 45 degrees or something like very similar to that and it's uh, important not only because uh, it's uh, the it's important for the reason that your uh, that your cut mark is not skewed like this but it's it's actually positioned uh, perpendicular to the surface and it's also important because if you are doing those two arches that uh, connects together to make a sinusoid thing and you have to uh, carve it from the outside as I was telling you. In if, if the lines would be meeting in this place and your tool would, would not be positioned right, uh, the meeting point would be visible. So if you are doing this in a right angle, it will be smooth and you wouldn't be able to recognize where, where the lines meet. So I think it's quite, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you can uh, feel the soapiness of the surface a little bit, even just a small soap. And then you scrape, you can see how very easily the material moves. And you also round the edges. So you have this uh, thing Jake was talking about. and it works much better on the edges so if you scratch your surface on the flats it's not that terrible you can still polish it you, you uh, don't have to uh, scratch only but you can also remove material by like a pushing action with the with the chisel as you would be normally carving wax and or in wood so every possibility is open method how to how to smooth the surface it, it is way too soon to use the steel wool but we have uh, time for our presentation is to use a uh, steel wool on a wet su uh, wet surface of antler and it really polishes nicely you can uh, already see some glossiness is brought to the antler and you can see it somehow s smooths and rounds the surfaces and I would like to show a little bit of fine carving and engraving before we uh, have to finish so I'm choosing this tool which is like 1.5 millimeter to the tool that's uh, 1 millimeter it allows me to be able to turn around a much smaller radiuses and and also uh, come closer to the uh, to other corners because the thing is that if you are using a rotary tool that's uh, that's round in cross section and you have uh, you have this cross section of material you are placing it like here so this is your uncarved portion and the smaller the tool the smaller the uncarved portion is so you want to for the fine engraving you want to go closer so you choose a smaller tool the smaller tool um, there is a how do you call it the surf surface speed is smaller so you so you are losing the advantage of being really fast but you are getting a advantage of being pretty like precise 
So I think I would uh, carve some cross hatching here and then fill it with uh, basket work just to show you how you can ornament the surface. You can see that uh, previously, when uh, before I uh, submerged the thing into water, uh, the the filings were flying everywhere, and now they are quite damp, so they are adhering to the surface, which is uh, better for your health, uh, not so not so good for visibility of what you are carving. So I now remove the burrs from the edges of carved material. You can see a little checker pattern and now uh, what I will do is I would um, apply uh, grace lines in each of those uh, squares and it, they will be alternating in their direction so it will create a basket work pattern. I wouldn't bother to um, actually draw it because it's a, it's a uh, mathematical function so I better I am putting two grace lines in every square. Turning the piece 90 degrees. So. That's about what I'm able to show you in uh, in one hour, but you can see that I was able to cut the shape and do uh, main lines. Uh, start rounding the lines and surfaces and even ornament some depth of the carving. So here it is. And if you have I think I have uh, five minutes or something like that to answer any questions from uh, present audience or internet audience. Well, off the internet, um, uh, Alexander Hindering, how much of this is a preset pattern in Petra's mind and how much is made up as he goes along? Um, I think that I'm uh, more impressionist than Jake is. So I think uh, you, you I think uh, adjust like 10% or five, and I'm more close to like to 20 or something. Mm -hmm. So 80, if you have a plan that you for 80, fudge, uh, fudge yeah. the rest, the yeah, 20%. All right. I think I do my completely made up guess. <laughs> <laughs> and you mostly um, uh, apply uh, coloring or patina to your work at your coffee and tea, as uh, Peter was mentioning. Uh, I'm actually uh, using a lot of uh, beach tar, which is an oily substance, which is a byproduct of uh, charcoal making. It's a distillation product of wood burning. Or I am using uh, permanganate to stain the uh, antler chemically and then uh, gloss over the high spots with steel wool and it brings some, something to it. I'm using also uh, water diluted but alcohol-based uh, wood, uh, wood stain. Uh, so I always water dilute it because if you, if you don't, it wants to go really deep into antler and you are not patinating it, but you are just uh, dyeing it or staining it. Do, with permanganate, do you find that it, um, the, it lightens over time? No. Okay. But I heard uh, that it lightens and that it turns uh, pink. Never. Yeah, I've had I've used it on maple and and it'll over as the as the maple ages it, it becomes lighter. Okay. Uh, no. So it's actually but maybe not not an antler. Okay, but possibly not. I, I never experienced that. What about sealing the antler to uh, with anything like wax to prevent 
uh, shrinkage or cracking from drying? Uh, I think that if you if you use some oily substance that would uh, prevent water to uh, to go there and uh, uh, expand and contract, it would be good. But also, it will uh, naturally uh, yellow the piece a little bit, as uh, as uh, fat tends to do, and oil and wa wa wax is uh, fat, so it will do that. Mm. But uh, w wh when I'm using tar, which I which I used for this one, and this one is unpatinated, uh, it's oily substance too, so I think it's sealed and patinated at the same time. I see. And it makes it smell incredible. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, Your work does. smells yeah. amazing. Yeah, I is. have uh, that two kinds of people. <laughs> <laughs> people who like that and people who I don't like. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Yeah. I have a question. Um, you're working uh, in this material. What other materials do you work using this method? I mean, how far can you take it? I did it on wrought iron. Uh, it, uh, it's... Uh, terrible on tools, but tools are cheap. Uh, if you think about them as tools, it hurts, but if you think about them as abrasives, it's just normal thing, you just throw away abrasives. So, and they are not like expensive. Uh, I worked on bronze, brass and silver, and wood, antler, horn. That's, all. That's about it, I think. Have you tried using the, the tungsten carbide? tools for working in iron or steel? Uh, yes, I, I'm using the tungsten carbide and uh, diamond coated for metal, but if you use it on uh, on uh, antler or bone, it burns it. it the friction is diff of different, it's not like like so much removing, it's more like friction and it burns and it, it's mm. not good for antler. Okay, great. Well, you have a, uh, one more question. How long did you practice to do that? I think what he means is how long you've been carving um, to get that, that good. Uh, People are in awe of your ability to do this as quickly as you just did that. 16 years. 16 years. Like so just 16 years of hard work, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> he could be as good as this guy.